Yeah, um, thanks for having me. It's great to speak in front of people again. And um, yeah, so the way I structure this talk is I start with a short part on neural networks um, in general, then go to the neural network potentials and then move a bit basically through my path in this field to, um, towards applications and give us a couple of pointers to what other people, people did. So, um, It should do something if I press that button, Claudio, but it doesn't. I have to put it on somewhere. Ah, okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, um, yeah, just in general, what do we want to do with neural network potentials? Well, in general, we want to parameterize chemical space. So, and this could be a potential energy surface, for example, uh, yeah, in, a, in a local region like this, if you want to have uh, search for different conformers, or this could also be yeah, a more global exploration, or it could even be um, the, whole, the whole chemical space um, with um, completely different compositions, and so on, and depending on what you actually want to do, this uh, changes also a bit of the requirements to how you model your systems. For example, if you have this very local thing here, um, you might be fine without permutational invariance because in, in a small molecule, um, uh, you can basically assign I, uh, just, just an index to each atom and that might be fine for you. But um, if, if you're, if you start with something like this, you see here, you could, oh, in this case, this is not, you might have basically um, rotations of, of some, some um, uh, groups, and then you might actually want uh, to have permutational equivariance or invariance. And then of course there are the materials where you have, might have periodic boundary conditions, and then you also want to follow this, this symmetry. And if you get to chemical space, I'm, I'm a bit confused by this point, but okay. Um, if you go to chemical space, you also have um, different number of atoms. Uh, you have um, different atom types and that you somehow need to represent and, and perhaps even learn from, from one, uh, so transfer knowledge from one atom type to the, to the next. So, um, how do we, how can your networks help with that? Um, so basically what we want to do here is we have our machine learning black box, which for this, for the purpose of this talk is in your network. Um, we put in the um, atom types represented by the uh, nuclear charges and the positions of the atoms. And then we want to get some property out. For example, the energy, which is why well, it's normally called neural network potential, but you also might want to predict uh, other, um, other properties like um, partial charges, uh, dipole moments, or even uh, some ensemble property. Um, okay, um, so um, if we now have this setting and we know, oh, this is somehow what the neural network looks like, um, so you have all these neurons and you have connections and then there's some, some property you get out in the end. How do we actually put in a system? But before we come to that, um, first the um, announced neural network crash course. <laughs> so um, what is a neural network? How can you uh, think about this? What's the difference to the kernel learning approaches with brief oral already seen and also what, what is it perhaps uh, something common. So, and the first common thing is that we start off with a linear model. So here you see the, the, the basically the simplest neural network, which is called the perceptron. Um, and this is basically just a linear classifier. 
So you have your input here uh, represented by, by these uh, X1 and X2. So it's a two dimensional input. And then um, we have a constant input, uh, which represents the bias of a model. Because uh, as you've seen in, in other talks, we don't want to deal with biases. So we just treat them like parts of the input and then can them ignore them for the rest of this lecture. So, okay, um, what, we, what we're gonna do, uh, gonna do is just we multiply the input with a weight, um, we, the second input with a different weight, then we have here the bias that comes in, then we sum everything together. That's basically the linear part here. And, and then since um, this is a perceptron and a perceptron is a classifier, we need um, to decide um, uh, is it class, class A or class B, or in this case here, the positive blue class or the negative orange class. And the way we can do that is by just looking at the sign of this function. So if you look at this, we have the W, which is um, orthogonal to this, to this line here. So it's points in the direction where the, um, in the basically in the, direction that's relevant to the classification so it doesn't matter where the where the data is in this direction so if you're if you're here and you go here it's still the same class the same here but if you go in this direction uh, orthogonal to this decision boundary then uh, the sign and the value of the function should change so that's why we have this kind of um, um, linear model here and then the sign, which we call um, the activation function. So basically, um, the origins of, of new networks are basically the biological um, modeling in the brain. And there people think, okay, there's some activations coming into this neuron. And then there's some point where the neuron says, okay, that's it, I'm firing. And I'm um, uh, basically, um, send a new signal to the next neuron. So that's, a, that's why it's called like that. And um, yeah, and this gives us a decision boundary like this. Um, and in the two dimensional case, this is just a line. Then in 3D, you have a plane that separates the data and in higher dimensions, you have a hyperplane. Okay. So now the problem again is that we just as we had this in Matthias' lecture, um, we just have a linear model. And in this case, we also have a classifier, but most of us want to do regression actually. So um, the first thing we can do is look at this function here. So this, the sign is not really, really nice, right? So it's, it, it jumps uh, from minus one to one. Um, and yeah, you don't, you don't want that in a regression, for example, but also you don't want that in a classification. Right? Come to this point. So you can use different activation functions. So one, one, one uh, obvious choice is the sigmoid. So it, it's similar on well, the 10H here, um, which is like a step function that smooths and goes from one to from zero to one or from minus one to one. But in modern neural networks, what you often have when it comes to classification are uh, uh, so-called rectified linear units. Uh, so that's uh, um, basically a neuron with this kind of activation function where you have zero if you're uh, less than, if your input is negative and the input um, gets just passed on if the input is positive. So you're basically just clipping any negative values. And yeah, similar to that are these LU, uh, exponential linear unit and, and soft plus, oh, there's a T missing, oh. um, which are basically um, uh, something like, um, so they're basically similar to the LU in that they are um, saturating at zero and going to the identity if you go in the positive direction. But you could also have something like, uh, like this, which is um, sometimes used um, to get um, 
to get a fast approximation of the 10H function here. So yeah, you have a linear part in the middle and you just clip uh, at the top and the bottom. So you see, you can use very many different activation functions, but that still gives you uh, not really uh, a way to, to go to nonlinear um, uh, predictions, because as you see in here, we're just applying it to the output of this linear model. So um, um, if you have a linear classification, it's scaling basically the output here, but it's not really changing anything in terms of expressiveness. So the key is uh, to use multiple layers of neurons. Or, and um, that's why it's also called deep learning. So um, each of these is basically a neuron here. Um, and then um, we have multiple outputs. So, oh, well, these are our inputs in this case. And uh, these are multiple neurons that receive um, data from, from the input. And what we're doing now um, is we add a layer in the middle so that we don't have just multiple perceptrons stacked here, but we actually have, um, yeah, this recombination of the outputs of these perceptrons. And um, there's uh, something, uh, some really important property of this structure, which is a universal, uh, is, uh, which is, um, it is a universal approximator. So that means if you have one hidden unit, uh, one hidden layer with enough uh, of these units, you can uh, approximate any function. And um, now if we compare that to a kernel method, so, so um, what's, what's actually the difference here? So the kernel method we saw before basically has this feature map here and is otherwise a linear model. And we have to define this feature map either explicitly or implicitly by defining a kernel function, uh, but then it's fixed and we can't change it anymore except for hyperparameters. And uh, in a multi-layer perceptron, instead of a fixed feature map, what you have is um, basically in this case, it's just, yeah, this perceptron we've seen or in this case, multiple perceptrons, um, like on the slide before, stacked on top of each other. So basically you have a neural network that you put into the next layer and then you put it into the next layer and so on. So um, this feature uh, gives you the possibility to basically learn the feature map. So uh, while in a, in a kernel method, you have to predefine the kernel and by that the representation of your data here, you can learn the representation of your data by um, adding layers to your network. And here's just an uh, informal representation of how this might look like. So you could have uh, here like this, this 10H activation function and you have two inputs again and different weights. And if you recombine this, uh, you get suddenly uh, this which looks like a Gaussian function. Um, and what you can basically do is you can separate the space uh, along different hyperplanes and then recombine them. And if you think about this, even if it's very inefficient, you could just basically um, separate each infinite, no, not infinite, as it, each um, small, um, part of the space and then give it a value by scaling. So that would of course be not very uh, reasonable to do, but that's, uh, that's uh, something you can think about in terms of why it's possible to um, do everything in what, with one hidden layer. Okay, but we of course don't do that normally. So what we're doing is we just add a second hidden layer. Uh, and just for fun, we add a third hidden layer. Um, so why do we do that? Because I just said one is enough. But um, the thing is, it's not very, um, it might not be very efficient to, to take one. So think about that. Let's say you have six neurons 
Uh, you could arrange them like this. So um, uh, you have basically one input, six hidden neurons, and then one output. Or you could arrange them like that. So yeah, that you have three hidden layers with each two neurons. So the difference is, if you look at all the paths through this network, here you have only six. While in this case, uh, you have eight, right? So you have two possibilities times two possibilities has two possibilities. And of course, if you have much more um, layers and neurons, um, you can basically, uh, you have an exponential growth of these paths with the, with the depth of the network. So that means with the same number of neurons, you can, ex, uh, and, and with that also with the same number of parameters, you can get um, a very high um, expressive, uh, expressive power. Um, there's also an alternative view, which is called information bottleneck, uh, the information bottleneck perspective which I don't want to go too deep into, but basically if you each of these is a linear, it's basically a linear model. And if this has an, uh, some kind of null space, you can remove some information in each of this mo these models. And by that basically filter, a lot, filter out a, a lot of um, unnecessary, unnecessary information, which uh, is harder if you have this high dimensional space here, which in, in, in just one layer. Probably, um, well, it's just informal, like I said. Um, if you want to look into this, uh, be prepared for a lot of uh, information theory and mutual information. Okay. Um, so um, now let's um, look an, at an example how to train a neural network. So, and this is just a simple multi-layer perceptron. So um, we have, um, yeah, we, re, we have the, the linear transformation in the beginning. Then we have our activation function, that, uh, the, the 10H, and then we get our, basically our hidden activation. And we use that, um, apply the second um, linear transformation to get our prediction. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at the regression uh, and we are therefore using uh, just the squared loss that you've seen before in, in previous talks. So how can we now train this? So this is called also the forward part. So we take actual data. So XI is one point I of our data set and pass it to the model. And then we can calculate the error or loss LI. Um, now, if we want to minimize this error, the only thing we have to do is um, doing a gradient descent on this error. So we want to get the um, derivative of the loss with respect to our parameters W2 and W1. And you can do this easily by um, just applying the chain rule. So take the derivative of the loss with respect to the prediction, then with the prediction to the uh, parameter here. And then in case you want to know about the W1 parameter, you first have to take the derivative with respect to the uh, hidden uh, activation and then hidden activation with respect to um, parameter W1. So it's just a bit of um, matrix calculus. And um, if, you, if you write this down, what you see is here, um, these terms reappear uh, from the forward pass. So we already calculated that. So we can just reuse it uh, to calculate the gradient. And the same here for the, for the um, activation function. So that means if you want to train in your network, what you use is basically a mix of, of using the chain rule with some dynamic programming. That means um, saving the intermediate results. But I would recommend you to actually use Autograd um, because that's the tool that's, that's made for exactly this task. Um, because if you're now going from, from something simple like that to some basically um, large neural network with millions of parameters, you don't want to 
do this uh, by hand. And there's also another uh, thing here. So I started with this, oh, the perceptron and the bio biological model and so on and so forth. And of course, it's much too simple to model anything that's happening in the brain. Um, and I guess no serious neuroscientist would, would do that. Um, but um, we're now at the uh, at, a, at a point where you can basically just say, oh, I just forget about the neuron stuff. Uh, I have basically some mathematical expression that is that I can uh, uh, differentiate and where I can apply uh, gradient descent on and I can train it. And that's actually all there is to it. Um, so that's basically what neural networks are and you can if you think about that, use any kind of operation where this applies. So you can use tensor products, you can use convolutions, you can, yeah, whatever you, you can think of and um, build your own um, yeah, neural network or structure and uh, apply this um, principle. So, and I think, yeah, so this was basically the crash course neural networks. And I think that's a good point where you can ask some questions on that before I move on to the, to the materials part. Any questions? Hey. The chat. From uh, the online chat, they're asking whether the number of layers uh, should be any uh, related to the number of features uh, you want to Utilize. Um, I don't think there's a simple rule to that. So I think that's that goes back to the to the tutorial. Just try it out on your data, and your, so it really depends on on your problem, on the complexity of your problem. But I guess um, if you have I would say if you have more dimensions in your data, you can probably add more layers than if you have just one dimension. Um, but it really depends on the case. Uh, perhaps another thing, um, because I said, oh, you can use um, yeah, every kind of, of structure. So there's one thing that I should mention. This kind of neural network is not, it's not a convex um, optimization problem. So if, if you have kernels, this is, nicely defined is convex you can solve that analytically here that's not not the case so even though you you can basically use any kind of analytical expression if you don't if you're not careful you might uh, fall into the trap of um, creating something where you would just fall into a local minima and um, you might not want that um, because it might not be a good fit for your data but if I go back to this part, so similar to how we use the feature map in kernel methods to, to basically make some uh, problem um, linear by increasing the feature space, we can do the same in neural networks. So if we increase the, the dimension here, we also make it, yeah, but perhaps also uh, more linear, but you also increase the chance that there's a good path to your uh, to to a good optimum in your learning problem. So you shouldn't start with three neurons. Perhaps you might use a bit more neurons. Okay. So this very hand wavy <laughs> neural networks introduction uh, is, I guess. Um, now, good starting point to go into the back into the discussion on how to encode atomic structures because uh, just I had a fixed number of neurons to put in some data, um, but what how do I do that if I have sometimes ten atoms, sometimes twenty atoms, or I have periodic boundary conditions? So one approach was would of course be to just take some of the existing. Um, descriptors so this is a very old slide actually so here you still have the coulomb matrix by matthias who talked already and there was a sign matrix by by felix faber who uh, gave a talk also on, on the first day 
and then the usual suspects like soap or the atomic symmetry function, which are, so most of these are used uh, for kernels, but the, the, the atoms, atom centered symmetry functions are, uh, yeah, by uh, Bella um, and Parinello uh, developed for, for actually a new network approach. And um, yeah, so that was an update I did a couple of years later. I also had the FCHL kernel, for example. So you see there, there's a lot of representations that you could use. Um, so let's just have a, a look at the symmetry functions. We already saw them earlier in the tutorial. Uh, so we have basically uh, functions uh, around um, some atom that represent the neighborhood. So for example, here the distances um, or also uh, the angles. And then um, we use these features to put this into like a local neural network that just gives us a, an energy uh, that's character uh, that's basically a contrib energy contribution of this local neighborhood. And yeah, if we do that for all the atoms, uh, we can then in the end take these energies, sum them up and get the final um, total energy that we want to predict. And so remember I said, okay, you can use any kind of um, differentiable um, yeah, function to, to define a neural network. So in this case, it's just the sum here. So we, we don't really need to know these local contributions to the energies. Uh, we just need to know the final energy and then um, do back propagation through the sum and through all these networks to the features. Um, so basically, um, yeah, you have like this first part of the network. So we enter with the charges and the, the positions uh, and um, get basically your features, the atom center symmetry functions. And then we uh, just put this into a new network to get our prediction. Um, there's a different approach. And this is what I will spend like the rest of the talk uh, about, which is, um, you, you model a neural network that directly encodes um, or that directly learns a representation just based on your raw inputs. So in this case, um, the atom positions, or you could also say the distances between atoms. Um, and you don't really have to define any, kind, any more kind of feature than just these um, basic things like distances, or perhaps if you want angles. And then the second part just looks the same. It's just a prediction of these energy contributions and the sum. Okay, so how can we do that? Um, let's say you have a water molecule like that, and you want to predict your energy contributions from, from each of these atoms. So the first thing you can do is um, you say, okay, um, I just, um, assign um, um, a so-called embedding vector to each um, atom type. So hydrogen gets one, at one vector, this hydrogen gets the same vector, and the oxygen gets a different vector, of course. So that, that would mean if we do that and we feed that to our output neural network, E1 and E3 would be uh, if the same uh, energy, E2 would be a different energy, we sum this up, we get a total energy. And um, the problem is if we now move these atoms around, we always will get the same energy because it only depends on the atom types in this case. So the next thing that we can do is we say, okay, we re replace our representation of the hydrogen um, with something that is basically corrected um, by the influence of the neighboring atoms. So we say, okay, we also add to this vector we already have um, some function um, of the oxygen representation that we know um, and the distance between uh, these two atoms. And we do the same between the two hydrogens and then we get a new representation for this hydrogen. And we can also do the same for the other hydrogen and the oxygen. Okay, what we now have at each atom, we know about the distance implicitly in our vector 
it rep pre represents each um, atom. And um, that means we have basically something like something like a pairwise potential. Um, so the next step of, would of course be just to repeat this. And now we, we basically do the same thing, only that we already knew in our neighboring atoms about the distances. So we get now higher order correlations between these atoms. And we could, can do this multiple times and then predict an energy uh, contribution for each of these atoms, sum it up to the energy and train it as before. Um, and now um, we have, if we do this multiple times, we can basically get a complete description of our structure here. And uh, this is what we did back in 2017. So 2017, this was published, uh, which we called the deep tensor neural network. So basically we started with this kind of atom abetting of each atom type that I just showed. Then we said, okay, we add a correction. Um, uh, Vij for each pairs of atoms, i and j. Uh, so we sum over all the neighbors j here. And this interaction we model like this. So we said Vij is this kind of tensor layer. So we, ha we have the, the representation interacting with the distances. Um, and then we also have these linear parts. And then, of course, the bias we never care about. Um, and one nice thing is if you do it like that, you can approximate this kind of tensor product here. So especially this part by first projecting um, both the representation and the distance here into some kind of factor space, uh, do an element bias product and then uh, project it back to your future space. So that um, so this kind of factorization was um, basically inspired by our uh, a machine learning paper by uh, uh, Sutzkever, uh, Martens, and Hinton generating text with recurrent neural networks. And the fact to do these interaction corrections was actually um, inspired by a network, uh, a paper by Scarcelli et al., uh, the graph neural network model, which was from 2008. And um, And so there was basically this early graph neural network paper that I think, I don't know, I think it was not that um, famous at the time, but then got cited a lot once the whole graph neural network thing picked up, um, which was just in recent years. So because shortly after uh, this paper, um, there was a message passing neural networks uh, by Gilmer et al. Uh, which was about um, how to use graph neural networks uh, to um, to predict um, yeah, quantum chemical properties, and um, so they basically developed this this um, yeah, message passing scheme, uh, which is um, quite similar to to what I just showed you. So you have basically you sum over a neighborhood uh, of a node in the graph. And then you have have this message function, depending on the on the on the nodes and the edge. In this case, I just plugged the uh, distance in here. And then there's this um, so-called update function, which takes the previous um, node representation and the message, and gives you a new uh, node representation. So basically, this is just a general formulation of what I just showed you. And actually, they also had re uh, a reference to the deep tensor neural network here, where they just showed that um, if you set the message function, you don't have to read it because it was on the previous slide like this. And the update function um, like, like that in the text, you get basically that the deep tensor neural network can be seen as a message passing neural network. And yeah, and one important point here is since we are using the distances, we are automatically um, invariant to rotation. So, and also of course, to, um, to translation of the molecule. Again, shortly after this, um, we did another iteration on the, on the um, 
deep tensor neural network and what uh, and it was basically just a minor change to move well it helped a, a lot actually in the, in the prediction accuracy but it was just a small change in how we modeled the interaction or the, the message depending on what language you want to use but it's essentially the same thing um, uh, and that turned out that with this small change you can view this interaction as convolution so um, if you have normally if you, you probably have seen a convolution in your networks where you have this convolution kernel or filter that you move across um, an image for example so now you could think of, of of a molecule as an image and you have some filter as that's uh, seen in the background um, and then and now you basically if you want to uh, you, you basically shift the filter over this this um, this structure so and and calculate the values at, at the at the positions of the atoms now the problem is, of course, if you have a discrete filter like you have in a neural network, so it, uh, in, a, in a convolutional neural network, so that means you have just a three by three uh, filter matrix. Um, if you now move the atoms, uh, you will get a very rough uh, energy uh, prediction because you have this kind of discretization error. So the basically the, the the values will jump each time your your atom is located in a different pixel. So compared to an image, you don't, don't have this grid structure. So the idea is now, um, instead of having this parameter tensor, we can replace it with a neural network again. And then we can predict um, smooth, uh, continuous filters and also get a continuous prediction of the energy. And that's basically just a variation of what we did uh, in the deep tensor neural networks. Um, and it also is a nice view on these things because in the, it's not just, um, it's not just um, telling you, oh, the, there's a, one atom sending a message to another atom, but it also tells you something about the space around the atoms. So it, it's more like a potential actually. Um, Yeah, and since we're here in a, on a, in a materials workshop, um, I also want to show, say something about periodic boundary conditions. So of course, we're summing over neighbors. And if we do that by um, respecting the periodic boundary conditions, um, we can just as well uh, predict materials. And you see, for example, if we have just this radial filter here, um, so there are different different um, filters that, that I got from, from the net, uh, one of the first networks, uh, <laughs> networks net, uh, schnets that I trained on, um, on um, I think the materials project data. Uh, and then you see this with different periodic boundary conditions. So basically the uh, periodic boundary conditions are reflected in the convolution filter. Okay, so and this is how uh, the architecture of the net looks like. So first we have this embedding. This only depends on the atom types. And then we have these interaction layers. And finally the output, just a network just before and just like you would do this with uh, uh, the atoms, atom centered symmetry functions. And each of these interactions uh, are these kind of correction blocks. So that means you add uh, this, it's also called a, a res, a residual um, structure from, from the ResNet um, architecture. Um, then you can uh, add this correction um, where you have on the one hand atom wise layers. So that are basically just linear layers applied to, um, apply to each atom uh, separately. And then you have this convolution I just showed you. And then to get the filter, we, we can have a filter generating your network. Um, yeah, it looks like this in the case of Schnett, for example, but it could be any neural network um, as well. And of course you need at some point um, 
and nonlinearity to get some kind of um, nonlinear um, features in the in the why why you're building the representation. Okay. Perhaps that's a good time to ask again whether you have questions before I move on to equivariant networks. Okay, then I will just move on. If you find some questions you let, uh, in the chat, you let me know. Okay. Um, so I just... Um, told you um, that in the message passing, we get um, rotation invariance when we use distances directly um, as, a, as characterizing the edge, basically. But this is, um, in the usual case, not ideal. Um, so because we re require local representations um, so that we can scale linearly with a number of atoms. Um, so if we are, if we basically um, increase uh, the system, we don't want to uh, have or the number of distances explode quadratically or even have something worse. Um, uh, but we want to have this uh, linearly and that's why we introduce a cutoff on the distances. But if we do that, that means that the local environments might have a higher symmetry than the whole system has. So for example, here in uh, in, in this, um, yeah, in this um, example here, you have the the, the blue um, node and the red node and some cutoff distance chosen uh, as, as marked. Can you see that? Yeah, I think you can. And um, if you look at um, at the blue node, um, it has the same distance uh, to the neighboring nodes as. Uh, as in this um, structure, and the same for the red one. And that's because the, um, yeah, the cutoff is basically too small to also capture the distance between the two white nodes. And let's just call them atoms. <laughs> it's, it's not a realistic molecule, but let's just call them atoms. So let's, uh, so between the two uh, hydrogens, <laughs> um, so you don't have this, due to the small cutoff, you don't have this uh, distance represented here. Um, so that means for the network, if you do use this kind of cutoff, both structures look the same. And if they have different properties you want to predict, um, then, um, yeah, then that's not possible with this architecture. So what you would need to do is perhaps increase the cutoff, but you don't want that in many cases. For one reason is that, um, yeah, the computational demand. And the other reason is that if you increase a cutoff, you have basically a larger space that you have to model with your local networks. So that might um, uh, be bad for your generalization because if I have a small space and I can basically um, partition my molecule in, in, in this, uh, smaller areas, it's much easier to learn. Um, so in order to still distinguish these two structure, we need to retain some additional directional information uh, because that's basically the, the, the thing where these two um, structures differ. So on what we proposed uh, to solve this problem is uh, what we called a rotationally equivariant message passing. Um, so you have now this message function that is more general. So um, we now also we have uh, the node representations as i, as j that we had before, but we also have now uh, vectorial representations for each, each node, so vi and vj, and we take the direction rij, so basically the vector pointing from one atom to the neighboring atom, <laughs> not just the distance. So now, um, in order for that to be useful, what we have to ensure is that our message function is rotationally equivariant. That means if I rotate the input x, and this refers especially to the 
to the edge Rij and also to the Vij, uh, uh, Vi and Vj. Uh, then the, the, the output of the message, message function should rotate um, in the same way. And um, if you look at that, what this essentially means is that this is a linearity constraint on the dire directional information. And if you think about it that way, you can easily find out that there are a number of equivariant building blocks to, that you can use to construct your method function. So on scalars, you can use any kind of nonlinear function. So basically any kind of neural network uh, that won't change since yeah, the scalar won't change the directional information. Then you can also scale uh, vectors uh, however you, you want. You can have a linear combination of equivariant vectors. So if, if, if you have, um, for example, multiple feature channels, you can uh, recombine them uh, uh, linearly. Um, you can have vector products or you can have scalar products to get from the vector representation to the scalar representation. <clears throat> So, and of course, um, if you look at this, so you can scale a vector, but you can apply any kind of nonlinear function to a scalar, then um, what something that basically directly follows is that you will always apply your nonlinearity to the scalars and then um, use that as some, something called a gating nonlinearity by rescaling the vectors with that. So, and here is then how our new variant, which, which we call pain pol polarizable atom interaction neural networks. And I will go into this polarizable part a bit later um, in the talk, why, why we call it like that. So, uh, okay, I can spoil one reason to get a nice funny acronym, but <laughs> there's also an, uh, another reason. So, um, yeah, and then we have basically this message parsing function again, and I don't want to go too much into this weird stuff here. <laughs> um, but what's important is if you look at the interactions, they're again um, convolutions. So for the scalar features, it's exactly what we had before. That, so that's identical to Schnett. But now for the vectorial features, um, what we get is uh, these two parts here. So the first part, basically, um, so this is basically a nonlinear, as a scale, uh, as um, a nonlinearity on the scalar multiplied by the vectorial feature. So this is basically a gating nonlinearity. And then uh, we convolute this with a, in, a rotationally invariant filter. And on the other hand, here we just have a scalar feature, uh, a scalar node representation. And then we convolute this with a rotationally equivariant filter. And this is something that you can also find um, under the keyword uh, steerable convolutions. Uh, so there's uh, some work on that also for uh, the usual convolutional, convolutional neural networks. And you can basically obtain an, an equivariant filter by taking the invariant function and taking the derivative with respect to, um, to, your, to your input, Rij here in our case. And yeah, we don't really have to use a derivative here. We can just use a neural network to basically model the derivative and still have an equivariant function here. So we have basically the radial part here and then the directional part is just the normalized vector. So now how this does this affect our problem with representing these systems? Um, so we have here an example system, we have um, these two to uh, this um, ferrocene, um, and we have these two rings that we rotate um, against each other. So um, we used three kinds of networks. So Schnett, then DimeNet, which is, um, I think that was the abbreviation for directional, or for, I don't remember. So basically they, they use angles as part uh, of the of the network to encode some direction information, and then we use pain where we use this equivariant message passing. I think it was was called directional message passing, probably yeah. And um, 
And then we use different cutoff distances to model just the energy profile when rotating uh, these two rings against, against each other. So if we have a cutoff of four angstrom here, we get more or less the correct uh, energy prediction with all networks. And then we reduce that to three angstrom. And now you see uh, that net is failing because uh, we don't get all the distances in the cutoff and we can't propagate the direction information since it's since once we're having the representation of an atom or the we, we basically con, um, we um, collapsed all this information into one scalar so all the direction information is gone and we can't um, pass it on with a, in the next interaction pass and um, here if we go to 2.5 angstrom even even DimeNet is failing to catch that, and uh, Payne is still predicting the energy profile correctly. So uh, why might this happen? So here's one guess. So if you're using angles, the two structures that I showed you before um, would still have the same representation. So because it's still the same angles. So if you want to do, if you want to get this directly, you would need uh, something like dihedral angles. Uh, but if you use directional information, you see uh, like here with these vectors, um, then it makes a, differ a difference because now you can pass this information on by projecting the vectorial uh, representations uh, from, from this, uh, from the red atom to the blue atom, and you will get um, yeah, different results here. So different representation. That means you can resolve um, uh, these two structures here correctly. Okay, a different, um, so actually what's the time? Oh, okay, good. I was, I was actually worried that, I'm, um, that my talk gets too short, so I added something in the end. I will probably leave that out. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, um, now what we can do is um, also predict tensorial properties because now that we have the vector, uh, the vector representations of the atoms, we can express a, a tensor, or, or you can express a tensor as, uh, as a factorization of rank one tensors like this. So that means you have um, the scalar part and then a tensor product here. Um, so we can um, use this general formula to, to predict, to use our vectorial representation to predict um, several um, uh, properties. For example, here, the dipole moment, we could predict that by take, uh, taking, so this, uh, a function of the vectorial representation here, plus um, a, the scale, a scalar times the direction Ri. And so you basically see that this is something like a local dipole, and this is the contribution, the contribution of the charges to the dipole. And that's how you can build up this um, basically dipole layer. And again, since it's just part of the neural network, you just need this dipole and can uh, optimize the whole thing um, with gradient descent and back propagation. And here's something similar for the polarizability tensor. Um, where we have the scalar, uh, um, uh, the scalar component, and then here we have the vectors times uh, the atom position. And to get this symmetric, we also have, have it the other way around. And using that, uh, we can, uh, when we learned these properties, we can run um, molecular dynamic simulations. So for example, here, this is a ring polymer molecular dynamic simulation with 64 beats for aspirin. And this simulation would have taken 25 years if you would do that uh, with DFT. Um, and we could do this in one hour. Of course, it, you can scale as the relation is important, right? You can always let it run longer or shorter depending on what you need. Um, yeah, and since we have the, the dipole moment and the polarizability tensor, we can then calculate infrared and uh, Raman spectra. Uh, 
So one further side note, and this is basically already a hint to a future talk of this conference, because I'm sure you will hear, hear more about that. Um, so um, this vectorial convolution in pain uh, is actually some kind of a special case um, because here um, we can see that as um, yeah as rank one tensors and we might want to um, go to higher orders um, higher order tensors so that means um, instead of having, having this linearity constraint we get, we're going to polynomials and um, an elegant way to do that is to use um, the irreducible representations and Klebsch Gordon products. So, what you do there, you say, okay, my, so now I just call it X, the representation of my atom X uh, of order L um, uh, is convoluted with some, it's convolved, <laughs> it's convolved with some filter W. And um, now I can express this this way so that I, ha I have, I sum over, um, over um, every L and M of, or let's start, start there. Um, so you have basically a circular harmonic that represents um, your direction Rij in your, um, for your order L and your component M. And then you have a radial filter here and um, to, to be able to combine these two uh, spherical harmonics. So the representation is a spherical harmonic and this part is a spherical harmonic, uh, this part is a spherical harmonic. Um, you use the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. And again, this is kind of a convolution. And um, so this is an approach uh, that was used, I think first in tensor field networks, it was using Comorant. And I guess you will hear more about this in uh, relation to um, to the NECWIP uh, network. Okay, um, perhaps any questions until this point before I go to the to some application part. Chatse asks. If you can share some experience on how you came up with such a complex architecture as pain, so I guess uh, the the thinking process behind the structure, and also is asking whether the model works from for long range interaction, long range interactions as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is actually not, uh, this looks more complicated than it is actually. So this. This part, I mean, this is already in, in Schnett, and, and this part is just actually a logical extension to go to, to the equivalence and go to, um, yeah, to, to vectors in this case. Um, and yeah, if you, if, you, if, you, if you start to painting this <laughs> diagram, it looks a bit more convoluted. Um, but um, it's really uh, much inspired by, um, how um, dipole-dipole interactions or dipole charge interactions would also work. In terms of uh, long range, um, of course, if I have, when I apply a cutoff, this doesn't work. So when we want long range interactions, we would uh, use a separate term. For example, what you could do, you could uh, predict local charges for each atom and then use an electrostatic interaction as a correction. And you can do similar things uh, for dispersion actually, and use some kind of, for example, there's, there are also some uh, many body dispersion layers, for example, in pi MBD um, that you can use. And we also have our own in, in our code. So now I have a little bit um, more abstract question rather than something in particular about that, is that, well, there is an argument and it's more mind but i find it um, i'm a little bit sympathetic to it so towards it basically says that any neural network no matter how complex that is is linear in the end and basically the whole thing that you do before is that you're uh, shifting your work into uh, 
finding a suitable representation on some machinery. And if say one would smarter be or more clever or something, they would just come up with such representation first. And so how how do you feel what, what can you say basically so, on so that? Basically, and and basically, but what's the advantage of the say of neural network compared to anything else? So basically you're saying I'm too lazy to come up with a good representation, right? Well, no, not necessarily, but <laughs> no, maybe. Okay, yeah, I get your point. So actually, I think for the um, for the geometry part, okay, but there's really I think one major thing. So if I want to really model the large chemical space, I have to get a good representation for atoms, for atom types, and how these interact. So, and I, what I don't want to do, I don't want to treat each atom type as orthogonal. Um, and then have terms for each pair of atom types and so on. So because that's, uh, for example, a major drawback of the, the builder networks um, that, you, you, that you have to do that. So here, once you have this embedding, this is much easier. You can compress this into this shared space with the, with the geometry. And this, but this is not straightforward how you would model that in a kernel or in a feature space. Okay, I guess it's, it's okay. I think you can debate later about this. Okay. <laughs> it's gone. Okay, so actually this net approach, this is how you can see it here. Oh, probably the people in the Zoom can see it. So this was uh, with my coworker, uh, Michael Gastecker and Klaus Robert Müller here. And um, this predates actually the pain um, network. And um, th this was meant as an extension to SHNET to uh, use um, also external fields. And um, so the idea is if you have um, a, a lot of the properties and also like the dipole moment or the polarizability are response properties. So if you now can, um, if you can uh, design a neural network uh, that depends on an external field, you can directly get these properties by taking the derivative with autograd uh, with respect to the field. So, um, so here, the left side is just net. And then on the right side, we have um, the field net extension so from the from the scalar representations, we basically construct something like local dipoles, um, like here, and this is very similar to what we later do in Pain, which is basically just a rec vectorial representation uh, that we we built here, and um, then we use dipole-dipole interactions between these features, and also dipole field interaction with an external field, which is uh, another input to the network um, to modify our scalar representations. And again, we do multiple um, of these interactions. And in the end, we just use like before neural network to predict um, the energy. Um, and then we can take the derivative um, with respect to the atom positions to get the forces. That's what we did before, but we can also take the, the first and second derivative to get the dipole moment and the polar polarizability tensor. Um, or you could also um, take different derivatives. So for example, to a magnetic field or to um, the nuclear moments to get uh, chemical shifts, for example. And yeah, that's also where, why we later named pain polarizable because it's basically, if you look at the rip here, this is a visualization of the representation um, surrounding a molecule. And once we apply a field, um, you see that how this um, gets polarized and the symmetry uh, of the representation uh, is broken here. And yeah, using that, again, we can uh, uh, simulate multiple um, spectra. So infrared uh, Raman as before, uh, and we can also do NMR spectra here. Um, what's, um, what's, but 
what's a real uh, advantage now is that um, when we when we want these um, response properties, we can basically just input a zero field and take just the, the gradient. Um, but uh, we can also apply an actual field and model the energy uh, under the influence of this field. For example, if we have a, a solvent model, uh, we can um, model the molecule in the solvent. So, for example, we can uh, so here in uh, in the dashed line, you see uh, the spectrum in, in vacuum. Then in, in blue, you see uh, machine, the machine learning model in a, a polarizable continuum solvent. And so, and basically the, the machine learning model is interacting over this field input with the continuum model. Uh, but you could also do what we call MLMM, so in analog to QMMM, you now have a molecular force field that um, models the solvent and machine learning is basically trained on, on, um, on a quantum chemistry method so, uh, so that we can then basically replace the quantum mechanics with machine learning and still just use um, yeah, the field input to interact with a molecular dynamics a solvent that's surrounding uh, the molecule. And then you see here uh, in red how this changes the spectrum. So for example, here, these peaks get shifted to the left and, and broadened. So here we use the charm general force field to, to, to get the spectrum. So finally, um, I want to show this one application to a Claisen rearrangement reaction. Um, so, um, if we, if we look at this reaction here, um, and we sample along the reaction coordinate, um, you see in, in vacuum, we follow, so, so we have the quantum, uh, mechanics, uh, as a reference and we, the machine learning model nicely, um, yeah, follows, follows the reference here. And then, um, we can do um, umbrella sampling in, in vacuum, but we can also do umbrella sampling in, uh, in, in the MLMM model, where we have, in this case, um, a water solvent. And you see how this then um, um, yeah, re reduces the reaction barrier. And this, is, this requires less computation time than ex explicitly, uh, yeah, Training on 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 data for the whole, um, yeah, for the whole solvent. And finally, one one idea that's pretty nice here is uh, that we can now say, okay, we have a differentiable model, so why not um, take um, reduce the barrier by taking the derivative with respect to the field, basically finding an optimal charge environment to re reduce this barrier. So um, you see, we started with these 30 something KCAL uh, barrier. And if we have an optimal field, so which, is, which looks something like that. So you see the molecule in the middle and then the positive and negative charges surrounding it. Uh, we can use this to around 10 KCAL. So the problem is of course, how do we, uh, how would you actually create such a field? Um, this we didn't tackle completely yet. Um, but one thing what you, that you could do is attach these kind of charged molecules in the surrounding of the, of the reaction. And um, if you do that, so this is just done by hand at the moment, um, then you still get a, a barrier at around 20 kcal in our predictions. So, um, What would be, of course, nicer is if you can actually directly generate this surrounding and, and don't have to place this, or don't ask your favorite chemist to do that for you here. Um, because in the end, I'm just a computer scientist. I don't know about this stuff here. Um, we, I need, uh, yeah, Michael Gastega who did all the chemistry here. Um, and for that, 
what we're currently working on are autoregressive neural networks. And I don't really want to start with that, but what I'm gonna tell you is what, what you now want to do in an autoregressive neural network is generate a structure. So, um, um, and, and the way we do this here is we already have an unfinished molecule where some atoms are already placed. And now we want to predict the position of the next molecule. And if you think about that, um, what we actually want to predict is a, some kind of probability function. And that again is just another target for on your network. So it's basically the same, same thing. Um, it's, it's just a regression <laughs> with some normalization because we have to get a probability. Um, yeah, but I don't want to go into this because I wouldn't finish in time. But you see, you can um, do all, all kinds of nice stuff. So um, I come to my conclusion. Um, so new networks are great to learn representations if, because you're too lazy to really construct them. It's, it's still, unfortunately, a lot of work to implement them and coming up with the architecture and so on. So it's a different approach, not, um, you, do, you don't get rid of the work, unfortunately. Um, and we can get the more data efficient if, if we encode more of what we know about the problem. So for example, equivariance, but I guess also in, in terms of different atom types, um, we might uh, profit from that. Or a different example was the influence of the field. And yeah, you can accelerate um, molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, you can um, model reactions and do in solutions and do inverse design. And beyond potentials, you can also, with some slight modifications, get an autoregressive model where you can actually build structures and condition them, uh, them on properties. So you might want to predict a structure that has a low energy and a certain homoeumo gap or band gap. And um, yeah, as a last point, I want to um, point at this uh, perspective that we've written um, with uh, Julia Westermeyer, who's giving a talk later in the week, uh, and uh, Reinhard Maurer from Warwick. And there we made the point that in the, in the workflow in materials and, 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 and quantum uh, and computational chemistry, there are, there are a, lot of, um, a, a lot of steps in this workflow where, that you can tackle with machine learning. And we basically uh, list uh, a lot of um, approaches that already exist and hint to some future possibilities. So if you're interested in where you can use machine learning in your workflow, look at that. And so I thank you for the talk. We have some software, it's called Schnettberg, if you want to start coding. And uh, there's also this book with a lot of contributions also from, from some of the people who are uh, here. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this super nice and broad overview on how we could apply neural nets to study problems in material chemistry. Is there any question from the... Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, it's kind of like more of a question about how you came to design the neural networks. So uh, you started off with deep tensor neural networks, which were kind of message passing uh, inspired, or they were doing message passing. And then you moved on to Schnett, and then you built on top of Schnett for quite a few uh, pieces of work after that. So what was the difference between deep tensor neural network and Schnett? And then what was the, like basically the idea? Um, it's, it's actually more of a technicality. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's really this interaction function. Um, 
Uh, oh, no, I'm too far. I got. <laughs> Sorry. Um, where is it? Yeah. Okay. So here, um, I started with this tensor thing, and everything was wrapped into this 10H. And if you do that, uh, if you do that, uh, then you can't write this as as a uh, as a convolution because you have this nonlinearity in there. And also, it turned out that it's not a good idea in terms of prediction accuracy. Um, um, yeah, and so uh, this is one of the differences. And then um, we also change the types of nonlinearity. So here it's 10H. Uh, in Schnett, uh, we're using soft plus nonlinearity. And I think we also just, I think the tensor neural networks didn't have a cutoff back then because we had these small molecules. So, but actually, uh, we found out that even with small molecules, having, having a nice cutoff works, works better because for the reason that I mentioned, uh, the smaller you make your local environments, the easier you can, um, you can learn this environment and the better you generalize. But then again, of course, you have to, you have a trade-off with um, this direction propagation and long-range uh, uh, effects. Are the representations learned better in some way in your experience? Again? Uh, in your experience, are the representations learned better with Schnett? Or... Yes. Okay. Yeah, but I, at this point, I would use pain, actually. So, in, so the pain network, um, with pain, it's about three times as data efficient. So you need three times uh, more data with Schnett to get the same accuracy as pain. So from what we are seeing on our data sets. So this equivariance uh, really helps um, to generalize better. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the interaction layer. How much does it add on to the computational time of uh, fitting the neural network? Um, you mean each one? Uh, so I, um, I, what I can tell you is with pain, um, I think for an aspirin molecule, the whole network takes, I think it was four milliseconds or something like that. So I didn't measure really what, what each interaction layer takes. So this is what this is with uh, three interaction layers in pain. Um, so um, I don't know. I, I, I think you won't get into the realm of, of um, microseconds, um, but I think that in, for, for molecules, you're in the millisecond regime. If you're going to materials, it's a bit more. Of course, it's basically scales with the number of atoms, right? Uh, it scales linearly or? Yeah, it scales linearly, uh, but well, the network itself, but then you have to collect the neighbors and then that scales like your neighbor list. So you can use any kind of neighbor list implementation. Um, and then it, that's basically the main part of the scaling. And if I can ask one more question, um, how generalizable is Schnett or Pain uh, in general compared to other non-end-to-end -end neural networks? Is it more, uh, does it more specialize to the system or is it more general? What, what do you mean? I, I mean, um, for instance, if I was going to do some transfer learning from one system to another and it's not really same. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, in principle, the, the representation has the expressive power to, to transfer. The thing is, of course, if you're, initial data set is very specific, and that could be hard. So this is really data dependent. Thank you. One last question I wanted to make is about uh, whether we, what are the ways you, you would suggest to have uncertainty on the prediction? Because we have yeah. seen these for GPRs and kernel methods, so. Right, so what we're doing, and which works in many cases quite well, uh, is using ensembles of, of this network. Um, so we're using this for, um, we have a project on crystal structure prediction where we're using that and that works pretty well. We're all having also a project with molecules and surfaces where this works very well. Um, I heard of cases from other groups that in certain, I think in certain reactions, 
uh, this doesn't work, but this is then a general problem that not just relates to Schnitt, but also to different, to different methods. Um, but there are also different uncertainty approaches one could use as, for example, this, uh, the, some um, dropout idea so that you can basically get an ensemble by using dropout, uh, so it's, which is basically probabilistically switching neurons on and off. Um, so there are a couple of approaches that we didn't really extensively study yet, but it would be interesting, uh, interesting to look into. Thank you very much. And thanks again for this fantastic talk. Thank you. So we see each other tomorrow at 